that right now in heaven, that's what they're singing around the throne. Amen. That's what the Bible says. That's what Isaiah 6 said when Isaiah got a glimpse of the throne in heaven. What, a, what an amazing thought that is to know that worship is not only going here on here on earth, but in heaven. Uh, and I, I don't even comprehend, I can't even comprehend everything that's going on there. But man, one of these days soon we'll be there. Take your Bibles in the New Testament. John chapter 11, if you would, this morning. Uh, John chapter 11. And thank you so much for being here. And visitors, thank you for being here today. Those of you joining on Facebook Live or YouTube at a later date, uh, thank you for joining in. I want to say a big thank you uh, to Pastor Copeland for uh, standing in the pulpit for me last week. where We had a wedding to go to in Arkansas for some dear friends, and uh, uh, of course uh, that got cut short, all of that. We went to the wedding but had to come back uh, because uh, last Sunday morning in the very early hours of the morning, our dear friend and longtime church member, Brother Jack Palvador, uh, went to be with the Lord. He died in his sleep. His sister told us, says, I come back, and then uh, Monday night late, and then Tuesday met with uh, Brother Jack's family and uh, Miss Cynthia, and, and uh, they said that he was, uh, you know, you remember a year ago, his ammonia levels were real high, and we almost lost him then, and, and I think that's probably what was going on here, and he was not able to stay awake to eat, and she said there was steak there, and so Jack normally will uh, plow through that steak, and, and he was having trouble, so uh, she told him, why don't you go ahead and go to bed, and I'll take care of Miss Cynthia and get her down for bed, and because uh, Brother Jack said he didn't want to go to the hospital, he made his sister uh, promise, uh, Jess, that he promised that he wouldn't do that. He wanted to die at home, and he went to sleep here and woke up in heaven. And we praise God for that. You know what? Uh, when my wife got the call, you know, she's always getting calls from her mom and, or the kids. And, you know, and so I was, you know, giving her, a, you know, a hard time about, you know, getting a call. And, and then when she hung up, and I could tell something different. And when she said that uh, Brother Jack had passed, uh, it, uh, boy, that, that, was, that was really hard. Uh, he's like a, he was like a father figure. We were uh, heading in Eureka Springs and maybe going up to Branson. We hadn't decided. We didn't have a lot of time to spend. But we turned around and started heading back, and except for a, a night in Oklahoma City, uh, we came back. And, uh, of course, I preached Brother uh, Jack's funeral on Thursday morning. And uh, the family wanted me to say a big thank you to all the Liberty family that was there uh, both uh, Wednesday night and Thursday uh, for the memorial service and all the kind words and everything. Uh, they, uh, they love our people. Of course, Carrie and Kevin uh, and Tim were raised here uh, many years ago, and Brother Jack's been a member since the late 70s, he and Cynthia. I went to uh, an unusual text in that message, and I, I, God led me, and I really struggled with it, and I preached so many different texts over the years, uh, and of course, my desire in a funeral message is to, uh, you know, remember the deceased, comfort the family, and exalt the Lord Jesus. But God led me to a text in the book of Job, and a particular verse where Job asked a question, if a man dies, shall he live again? If you die, will you live again? And throughout the message, I talked about the facts of death, one out of one person dies. Everybody dies. I talked about the statistics. I talked about uh, the appointment, the Bible says in Hebrews 9. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then after that, the judgment, we stand before Almighty God. And, and when we went out to the graveside, uh, and something I do every time, because so many people have questions about, well, he's in heaven, but here's a body that somewhat looks like Brother Jack, and so what, what's going on here? And I talked about how to be absent from the body is to be immediately present with the Lord Jesus and how, you know, we are a triune be, uh, being created in the image of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we are body, soul, and spirit and how that uh, the soul goes to be 
with the Lord Jesus immediately when Brother Jack closed his eyes in that last heartbeat that last Sunday morning, he immediately woke up in heaven with the Lord Jesus. And so we talked about all of that, and I talked about how that one day the trumpet's going to sound and the Lord Jesus is going to raise that dead body to meet that eternal soul. The difference is that body is going to be in glorified perfection. Amen? It's not going to be uh, like it was over the period of, even at, at that age, Brother Jack was 72, and, and of course over time as the Lord Jesus uh, uh, tarries and the rapture uh, uh, is prolonged as we wait for it, and as we look for our Redeemer, that body will eventually decay. And there's bodies in the sands of the sea. There's bodies in the, uh, the deserts and the woods of the world. We don't know. I think of Keith Mann. He disappeared some 25 years ago. They've never found his body. Young man, an all-star you know, baseball player in Wichita Falls, just disappeared. But somewhere his body is resting. His soul, when he died, immediately went to be with the Lord Jesus. He was a Christian. Now, just as God raised Adam from the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life, he breathed that into his body and soul in the act of creation of man. The Lord Jesus is also going to raise all those that died in the faith. Amen? And again, from the dust of the earth, the, in the event we know as the rapture. Excuse me this morning for my voice. But here's the deal. Death is a fact of each of our lives. Amen? It doesn't matter if you're young, it doesn't matter if you're old, life can turn on a dime just like that, and we can meet God in eternity. Now, you might find it startling this morning as we talk about this subject, but the reality is, and I want you to follow with me here, we go to work with dead people every day. We pass dead people in the grocery store every day. We sit next to dead people in restaurants every day. In fact, you might be sitting next to a dead person right now. Now that's strange, isn't it? What, now, Pastor, what in, in the world do you mean? Uh, you want to know the real truth of the matter this morning? You may be living with a dead person. And of course, I'm talking about those that are spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. In fact, before you were saved, the Bible tells us that we were dead in trespasses and sin. Now we're going to be in John in just a moment, but listen to what Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 says. Would somebody get me a bottle of water, uh, please? I don't think this Diet Dr. Pepper is going to cut it this morning. Thank you, Brother Willie. I appreciate you. But here's what he says in, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom, now listen to this, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature the children of wrath, even... As others, Jeremy Camp, I love, I love his music. He illustrates this point very well in a song that he wrote entitled Dead Man Walking. And here's how it goes. Freedom was something I never found. Trying to find six feet underground, under the weight of all of my sin, fighting the fight that I couldn't win. Now the good news of the song, song comes in the pre-chorus and in the chorus and here's what he says. Then you rescued me. Hallelujah. Amen. And now I can breathe. I was a dead man walking I'll, until I was a man walking with you. I was a blind man falling until I felt the life you're calling me to. Pulling me out of the darkness and pulling me out of the lies. Putting the beat in my heart again. I was a dead man walking until you loved this dead man walking 
back to life. Amen? The Bible says that before we came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we were spiritually dead. And Ephesians 2, 1 says it, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Amen? It's possible to be breathing air this morning and be dead. It's possible to have a heartbeat this morning and be dead. But when a person comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, what does Paul say happens here? He says that you're quickened. You're quickened. Now listen to what he says in Ephesians 2.5. Even when we were dead in sins, that's what that we were dead in, sin. You remember what God said in the garden? He said, by the way, man was never intended to farm. Man was never intended to eat animals. Man was intended to eat of the trees that God had prepared. And we don't even understand what these trees were. They were supernatural trees with supernatural fruit. And that supplied everything that man and woman needed in the garden to be healthy and happy and holy. He says this, you can eat of all those trees except for one. There's a tree, the knowledge of good and evil, and in the day you eat of that tree, ye shall surely die. And in that moment when uh, Eve was beguiled by the serpent known as the devil, Satan, and she partook, she instantly died in her spirit. Her soul became dead, and her body instantly began to die at that moment. And then Adam partook, and the same thing. And uh, Romans 5.12 says, For as by one man sin entered in the world, so that death passed upon all men, so that all were sinners. And so that's where we are today. Without the Lord Jesus, you are spiritually dead. The Bible says, Before the day that we came to faith in the Lord Jesus, we were dead. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Amen. I'm thankful for the quickening of the Spirit. What does that word mean? It means to be made alive. Amen? And so we learn here in the Scripture, it literally describes someone being brought back to life and given them new life. For me, Sunday, July 26, 1992, Liberty Baptist Church, right here where you sit this morning, in the words of Jeremy Kemp, I was a dead man walking. Freedom was something I never found. Trying to find six feet underground, under the weight of all of my sin, fighting a fight I couldn't win. But folks, that night, while I walked into Liberty Baptist Church, a dead man, I walked out of Liberty Baptist Church, a man alive in Christ. Amen? Why? He quickened my spirit, and I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so Paul describes right here, dead in trespasses and sin. But folks, the moment by faith that you repented of your sins and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, just like me, I was quickened by God's holy power, amen? His saving power, His grace, His mercy, and His Holy Spirit in that moment came to live in my eternal soul, amen? God does not reside in, in, in some uh, a temple in Jerusalem, he manifests his presence there before Jesus, but today he lives within the temple of you and of me for those that are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says it, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Old things pass away and all things become new. Amen. I was given a new life. And I've never been the same since that day, amen? I'm not going to go into all the details. I don't glorify my past, and, and, and I don't want to ever do that. But I can tell you, I was raised in church. I knew right from wrong. And then I went in the military, got out of the military, and went psycho nuts. And I call it my stupid years of living for the world and going against my God, my parents, my pastor, and everything I knew to be right. Why? Because I was lost. I was dead. I wasn't doing it just because 
I, I want to do it, and I, and I honestly believe that for the Christian, you'll be miserable if you do that as a Christian. Not only that, God will discipline you if you do those things as a Christian. But when I got saved, old things passed away, and things become new in my life. Why? Because I've been raised from the dead and, I, and, 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 and to walk forever in a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen? On three occasions we find in the scripture that the Lord Jesus raised someone from the dead. Now when you think about that, that's a miracle. Would to God that I had the power to do that. I don't. Only the Lord Jesus did. And, and the apostles had some uh, special gifts for a special apostolic time, those gifts are, cease to exist. I wished I could, especially when it involves little children and things like that. Brother Jack would probably punch me if I'd have raised him from the dead. He's like, what are you doing? I want to go be in heaven, amen? And so I, I wish that was something that I could do. I can't. But praise God, we find in the Word of God that the Lord Jesus could and the Lord Jesus still can, amen? Now, there's three uh, different occasions that we find this in the Scripture. And if you want to take some notes, well, the, one, of the, one of the three is the daughter of Jairus in Capernaum. And you remember the story, and we'll get into it a little bit. Then there was the widow's son in Nain. And then, of course, the one that we probably remember the most was the brother of Mary and Martha, whose name was Lazarus, who was a close friend of the Lord Jesus. Now, each one of these stories gives us a wonderful picture of the new life that we are given by the Lord Jesus Christ when we come to faith in salvation, by faith to salvation. And I want us to look at these examples real quickly this morning and what to understand, listen, this is what you need to know, what it really looks like to be alive in Christ, amen? And before we get into all the stories, I want you to notice the first thing this morning, the experience of the new life, the experience of the new life. And again, each of these three people are going to be, we're going to see in our text what? They experienced a new life. They were dead. They were dead. There was no breath. There was no heartbeat. And in, in, a, in one of the cases, they had been dead for four days. And I don't need to go into the grotesque details of what happens. As a pastor, I've had the unfortunate uh, events where I've had to meet police and go into uh, scenes where that was the case. It's not something I would wish on anybody. It's bad. It's unforgettable. But we find that as one of the, one of the situations here. So, but think about the experience of the new life. And I think you would agree with me uh, that what happened to these people when they were raised to life from the dead was a miraculous experience, amen? It was a miraculous experience. The Lord Jesus, what did He do? He performed many different miracles, many miracles. The four Gospels, which are called the Synoptic Gospels in the Bible, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they each record the same story written from the perspective that God allowed some uh, literary freedom to the writers, like Dr. Luke, uh, wrote from uh, the, a lot of his writings were uh, of a medical nature and from a doctor's perspective, where Matthew was, was very much about Israel and, and, and the king and the genealogy and all of those types of things. But the four Gospels give us account of each of these miracles that we're talking about. And we find many where Jesus healed the blind. He made the blind to see. He made the deaf to hear. Listen, he cured those that had leprosy. I mean, a leper in that day, and, and, and they had leper colonies and things like that in that day, but if you were a leper, you had to wear certain types of garbs and covering, and you would have to yell out, if anybody came near you, unclean, unclean. And it was a horrible thing to have leprosy. But Jesus healed leprosy, a miraculous thing. He restored those with withered hands. Amen? One lady that had bent, been bent completely over. I mean, walking around, and I, I don't dare even try to imitate it because I not, might not be able to stand back up myself. But she was bent. She couldn't walk straight, and he straightened her out. Amen? 
Not only physically, he straightened her out spiritually. And there's a long list of miracles that the Lord Jesus performed. But folks, to me, the greatest of all miracles is when he raised people from the dead. Now think about that for a second. And let's talk about this. Lazarus, of course, had been dead for four days. But when the Lord Jesus spoke the words, Lazarus, come forth. And by the way, he was very specific because if he had just said, come forth, all the graves would have emptied, amen. He had that power. But Lazarus walked out of that tomb alive. The widow's son literally being carried to the grave to be buried. The pallbearers, as it were, they had him in the casket. And Jesus said, get up. And he said, up. Praise God. Listen, the daughter of Jairus. Jesus was on the way to her house. He'd been met by her father. He's on the way to her house. And while he's there, and this is, uh, and I believe Jesus allowed this to happen to show his great power and to show what faith can do. And, 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 and while he was on his way, she died. And people think, well, there's no hope. She's dead. But here's what he said to the father. Do not fear. Just believe. Just believe. It's kind of like the father whose son had the, the demonic spirits. And he said he throws himself in the fire and cuts himself and, and does all of these things which are self-harm. And we see it in our culture today and we brand it all kinds of things and we try to medicate it. And I think it's a demonic possession or demonic oppression. We call it different things. In the Bible, Jesus said he, he was possessed. And he says, Lord, if you can do anything, please help my son. And he said, let me tell you something. All things are possible if you can believe. Amen. So each one of these stories that we've read this morning, what are they? They're great miracles. Listen, uh, to heal someone of blindness is a great miracle. To heal someone, heal someone that has leprosy is a great miracle. To heal someone that is, 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 has a withered hand or a bent spine is a great miracle. But the greatest of all miracles is what? Raising someone from the dead. Now as a Christian, God has done many wonderful things for you and me. Would you agree with that this morning? Amen. But the greatest miracle in your life and in my life is the day that the Lord Jesus Christ raised us from the dead to give us spiritual life in Jesus Christ. Amen? Anybody saved here this morning? Well, hallelujah. That's the greatest miracle of your life. He raised us all and gave us new life. I say that's a miraculous experience. Amen? But notice also, it was a marvelous experience. I've often talked about uh, some of the great days in my life. The Scottish noble John Maxwell said this, the greatest day in your life and mine. Now, young people, listen to this. Wake up and hear this. The greatest day in your life and mine is when we take total responsibility for our attitudes and actions. That's the day you truly grow up. And that's wise, amen? That's some good stuff right there. And I'm sure if we could interview each of these three people that the Lord Jesus raised from the dead, I think every one of them would say, you know what, I've had some good days in my life. I've had some great days in my life. But the, the, the most miraculous and the most marvelous day of all was when I was dead and Jesus raised me back to life. There's nothing that compares to that. That would be the greatest days in, 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 in my life, they would say. As for me, the greatest day in my life was when by uh, in, in repentance and faith, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen? There's special days in my life when I met my wife and we were married for 32 years this December. Y'all pray for me. I've been putting up with her a long time. I need your prayer. No, I'm teasing. Uh, the second, uh, you know, a special day was when I become a father. And I can close my eyes and I can go back to that delivery room and I remember every single detail of what went on and what happened in that delivery room. The day I became a father, the day that God called me into full-time ministry. 
And I knelt at this altar with my dad, my father. And with great tears, my dad didn't cry very often. With great tears, we prayed together, and I surrendered my life to full-time ministry to do and be whatever God would have me to do and be. And so there's, there's special days. There were significant days. When I graduated from high school with honors, that was a, a significant day. When I graduated with col- from college with honors, that was a significant day. When I graduated with, uh, uh, from seminary with honors, that was a, you know, I worked hard. That was significant. That was something very significant in my life. When my sons graduated from high school with honors, that was a big deal. When my uh, son started college, that was a big deal. Not a, uh, If you look in our family history and, and our genealogy, we're just uh, uh, poor people. Scotch Irish that came and, and settled in Pennsylvania in 1751, and, and you follow, and I followed the history, just poverty-stricken people like anybody else in those times in those early days. And not very many had the privilege of, of, of going to school, let alone to college. My own dad, Jack Ross, who you knew, his father passed when he was only 14. He had to quit school in the eighth grade. There's 12 brothers and sisters. He had to get a job to provide for the family. He would go on and get his GED and get trade schools and all those things and, and have a wonderful life and career. And we praise God for that. But th- this was something special when, my, when I, I, I was able to go to college and my sons were able to go to college. And, and then Colin graduated from Texas Tech with honors and then uh, from LU, Liberty University, with his graduate degree and with honors. And now he's working on his doctorate. And those are significant days. It's, it's a lifetime of work for me and my wife and for them, and we're proud. And then Christian will graduate this next December with honors. Right now, y'all pray for him. He's taking Spanish four, four. He's conjugating stuff, and I don't know. I can speak some slang Spanish, but it's not very good. I said, you might want to talk to Miss V. She could probably help you with that. But the point is, there's been special days in my life. There's been significant days, and, and the same's for you, and your mind can run to those, those moments, amen, when it's special, when it's significant. But folks, there's not been a more miraculous day and a more marvelous day in my life when, than when the Lord Jesus quickened me and made a dead man walking alive in Jesus. And I've never been the same. That's the greatest day in my life. And I tell you, if it had not been for that moment, I wouldn't be the, the husband that I've, uh, by the grace of God, been able to be to my wife. I wouldn't be able to be the father that I've tried to be to my sons. And I make a lot of mistakes, and I'm certainly not a perfect father, a perfect husband, and, and certainly not a perfect pastor. But by the grace of God, for almost 28 years, I've been preaching the gospel. And I, I praise God for that. But none of that compares to the day that he saved me by his grace, amen? I think probably every single one of those people that were raised to, from death to life, they would go by a cemetery and they would just want to shout, glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah, I'm not there yet. Listen, we can be sure that they never forgot the day when the Lord Jesus raised them from the dead. And neither can I forget the day that the Lord Jesus raised me from the dead, amen? What about you? Have you got over your salvation? I hope not. That ought to be a reminder every single day of Christ's wonderful grace. That's Him doing for you what you could never do for yourself and no one else is qualified to do it for you. And God's mercy, that's God not doing to us what we deserve and that's an eternal death in hell. Praise God for grace and mercy. And I'm sure... It's the same for each of you this morning. How, how can we possibly forget it? How, the greatest day of our life, I'll never forget that day. Notice not only the experience of a new life, but the second thing, the evidence of a new life. Have you ever heard the expression, just give me a sign? I know uh, one of the uh, country comedians used to do that, and he would kind of make fun of, you know, uh, redneck country folks were kind of crazy sometimes, and he'd go, here's your sign. And, uh, but have you ever thought about that? And, and let, me, let me say this when talking about signs. If you've truly experienced a new life in Christ, you will show evidence of that new life in Christ. If you've ever been saved, 
there will be evidence in your life that you are saved. I call them signs of life, amen. Let me put it another way. If there is in your life that moment in time when you were, and the Bible calls it being engrafted into the family of God, Jesus said, if there is the root of salvation in your life, hear me teens, hear me church, there will be the fruit of salvation in your life. If there's a root, there will be a fruit. Amen? And as we look at the three examples of the people, we can clearly see what? Evidence of a new life right here. And there's always evidence of our new life in Christ. You know, I've said it before, if you are what you were before you supposedly got saved, then you ain't saved. If you can still go to the same places and talk the same way and, 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 and run with the same crowd and, and you're perfectly comfortable with that, let me tell you something. I was running with some knuckleheads before I got saved and I didn't have to get rid of them. They got rid of me because I didn't talk like that anymore. I didn't drink like that anymore. I didn't go to those places anymore. I didn't have those attitudes anymore. Not that I was perfect, but you know what? I knew I did not want to be that anymore because why? The Holy Spirit of God was in me at that point. I want you to notice a few things right here as we look at these examples of Scripture. And every, every time, and I said this, I believe, the week before last, Every time someone is truly born again in Christ, in Scripture, what happens? Their life changes. There's no greater example than Saul of Tarsus, who later becomes Paul and on the Damascus Road. He's blinded. He's breathing out threatenings and slaughter in verse 1. He's persecuting the church. And Jesus says, uh, Saul, hello. Why are you persecuting me? Why are you doing this? He's blinded. He has a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. And he says, I'm not doing that anymore. Lord, what do you want me to do? Instant change. Instant. It's not a process. It's not some confirmation class. It's not some cataclysm that you can quote. Instant. There was no baptism that happened there with water. Instant. A dead man walking became a live man living. Amen. Notice as we look first of all at Lazarus, notice the change that comes with the new life. Listen, now we're in John 11 finally, okay? Verse 43. John chapter 11, verse 43. It says, and, and when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with what? Grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus saith unto them, this is probably Mary and Martha, the family and the friends, loose him and let him go. You know what? Again, he had already been dead for four days. He's not smelling like polo black, if you get the, the imagery here, okay? But he comes forth, and all those wounds of death, all that decay of death is gone, and he's raised to life instantly. Lazarus come forth. You know what happened? His entire condition completely changed instantly. He stepped out of the grave, he was loosed, listen, from the wrappings of death and the trappings of death. And it says, again, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. That's what happens when you get saved. A new creature. And what, what does that mean? Old things pass away. And all things become new. Amen? Amen. A new life in Christ always results in a changed life. Folks, why, why, why do I preach on these things? Listen, my job as your pastor for these 22 years is, is simply 
above all else, it's one thing. It's to get you to heaven with your faith intact. It's to see that you're saved and that your children are saved and that you live a life that is glorifying the Lord Jesus so that when you get to heaven, you can hear him say like Jack Pavador, I believe, heard him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And the crowns that God will give to you, like like uh, uh, Baldwin saying there about being able to lay those crowns. I don't want to go to heaven empty-handed. I want to be saved. I am. I'm being sanctified. That's a little bit like Jesus, hopefully every day. One day we'll be glorified, and in that day, in absolute perfection, we will have our crowns given to us. The Bible talked about those that would, would uh, die and their works do follow them. Listen to the second verse of Jeremy Camp's song, Dead Man Walking. He said, I look for the words but cannot explain a new kind of love. This is talking about when he was made alive in Christ. A new kind of love ran into my veins. You are the key to all of my chains, to all that I was. Now I am not a slave. So what is... What does salvation do? It brings us out of the tomb of bondage. It Listen, out of, the, out of the tomb of sin and the bondage of that dead corpse that we were, listen, we were walking around, we are set free from that. Now, I, I praise God that in Romans, Paul said, where, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Hallelujah. But he said this, he asked the question, he said, should we go and continue in sin so that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. And no true born-again Christian would want to test the grace of God. We would not want to. And no true Christian should ever be a disgrace to God's grace. Amen. Our life has completely changed. Why? Because we have a new life in Christ that we're given. The autobiography of Mordecai Ham is interesting to read. And the account of a revival he did in Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1932. And you go, Pastor, you always use these old illustrations. You know why? I don't trust any of these new books out there. The books I've got are from the 1800s and some from the 1700s and the early 1900s. And those old-time preachers that are already with the Lord are the ones I listen to. And you know what? Uh, I like what Adrian Rogers used to say. If, if, it's, if it's new, it's probably not true. Amen. So I'll just stick with the old, old stuff. I got the old book, the King James Bible, and I got the old preacher, and hallelujah, I'll just stick with that. Praise God. Mordecai Ham, 1932. Many people were saved at the meeting, but during that meeting, there was a man that had made his way into the meeting. His name was Wyatt Larrymore, and he was saved, but he was known as the kingpin of Chattanooga. And back in that particular time in the 30s, you remember Prohibition, you remember all the things that was going on, and according to the courts of Hamilton County, he was known for every conceivable crime, including murder. And it kind of reminds me of Top of the Old Terrace in Fort Worth, where Arlington Baptist University is today. And it used to be a brothel. It used to be an illegal gambling casino. And Bonnie and Clyde and James Browning and Benny Binion and all those guys gambled there illegally. And there was a a cat house there, and you parents can explain to your kids what that is. But uh, anyway, all that went on. And Larry Moore, that's what he did in Chattanooga, and that's what he was known for. And he was paying taxes on over $2 million a year that he had raised from illicit businesses, bootlegging, distilleries, gambling houses, prostitution. And he had over 300 men working for him to carry out these unsavory deeds. To keep a promise to his young daughter, he went to Mordecai Ham's revival meeting in Chattanooga. That night, Ham preached a message entitled, God's Last Call. God's Last Call. And Larry Moore came under such conviction of his sin, and I got goosebumps just for thinking about it right now because I remember when that happened to me, July 26, 1992. He came under such conviction, he ran to the front. He gave his heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? He, after that revival meeting, he, he went and told his, his men that worked for him, he says, boys, we're through. 
We're going to close all of the rackets and we're busting every single bottle of illegal liquor that we have. And from that time on, Larry Moore made his living by peddling fish on the streets of Chattanooga, Tennessee. But you know what he got to do as a result of what God did in his life? From a criminal to a Christ follower? He got to give his testimony of salvation in every church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And there are some very famous churches in Chattanooga. What happened to that man that was once so mean and crooked, even to the point of murder? What happened to him? Let me put it this way. Jesus in a person's life makes a difference in a person's life. Amen? It makes a difference. And when you meet the Lord Jesus, your life is changed forever. And it's changed. Listen, that change is made in a person's life. What is that? That's the evidence of the fact that you have a new life that now exists in your heart and soul in the power and in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. Folks, if nothing has changed in your life since you supposedly got saved, I'm going to say it, then you ain't never got saved, my friend. Now, you say, well, pastor, you want me to doubt my salvation? I'll let me tell you this. If I can get you to doubt your salvation, you're not saved. You can tell me everything under the sun. I know I'm saved. I know it. And I know what the Bible says. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Am I perfect? No. Have I made mistakes? Yes. Have I sinned? Yes. Do I ask for forgiveness of sin and move on past it? Amen. Yes. But as a follower of Christ that's born again in new life, listen, the life that I'm living, I live every day. I want to live it for the glory of God. Amen. I'm still rough around the edges sometimes. You probably don't see it as much as my family. You know, I come in and bark at them every once in a while. You got to bark every once in a while. Sometimes I bite too. Ask Alex, I bite. Folks, if nothing's changed in your life, there's a problem. Why? Because there's always going to be signs of life. There's always going to be fruit from the root. Amen? If any man be in Christ... If, if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. And old things are passed away, and all things become new. Old things are gone, new things are done. Amen? So Lazarus had already been placed in the burial tomb. He was bound hand, foot, and face in grave clothes. And I won't imitate him, but he was like a mummy. That's what they did. And they didn't have modern technology of embalming and stuff. The Egyptians did, but they didn't use it in the Jewish culture. And so they would, they would pack the body oftentimes with spices and, and things like that as people would come and pay their respects over the days and weeks that would follow after the death. And so all those spices and different things and, and uh, uh, different types of uh, herbal ingredients and stuff would, would help stay off a little bit of the odor, if you know what I mean. In his condition, in that, in that particular case, he was dead. But Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he was alive. Amen? What happened? And he immediately, and hear me, church, completely changed. Now I want you to go over to Luke chapter 8 for a second. Luke chapter 8. We're going to look at Jairus' daughter for just a second, and I'm going to have to hurry here. I didn't get to preach last week, so I'm going to try to cram two weeks into one. See, in Lazarus, we see what? The change that comes from the new life. In Jairus' daughter being raised from the dead, we see the cravings that come with the new life. Listen to what he says in Luke 8, 54. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Made arise and her spirit came again and she arose straightway and he commanded to give her meat notice the first thing the Lord Jesus did after raising this young maiden from she wasn't the maid that was a term for a young girl notice what he did when he raised her from death to life he told her family you know what she needs something to eat she's alive she's got cravings 
She, she woke up, spiritually speaking, alive. And, and, listen, and listen what she has now. She has cravings for some things. And Christ always puts in you when you're saved spiritual cravings of the Spirit of God. Amen. And as newborn babes, Peter said, desire the sincere milk of the Word. Why? Why do we desire that? That they may grow thereby. Why do we want the Word of God? Why do we read it? Why do, why do I uh, sometimes fall asleep listening to the Word of God being read to me? Or, or every morning before I, I go to work at my second job, I listen to preaching. I need the Word of God. And I, and, I, and I read it throughout the day when I have a few moments. Thank God for technology. And it can be used for bad, but it can also be used for good. And I have at my fingertips on my phone a Bible. As newborn babes in Christ, you desire what? To feast on the Word of God. Amen? That's the natural craving that you have. A new life always results in a desire, hear me, for the things of God. Now, I can't spend a lot of time here, but what does that look like in, in just real day-to-day -day life? Well, number one, it's just studying. You might not be a, a big reader. I get that. You know, uh, I, I, I mean, when I was young, I, I wasn't a reader. You know, my wife, she could lay in a room for eight hours and just read books, and, and, and that was her personality type. I wasn't like that. I got to be out uh, doing some damage to something outside, you know, running around with my head, hair on fire or whatever on my bicycle. But, you know... Uh, so I, I'm not one of the per types of persons who just sit still and read for hours. But folks, the Word of God, we ought to study to know the Word of God. We ought to be praying. Why? So we can talk to the Son of God. Amen? We ought to have a desire. And, and it's not three times a day. It's not five times a day like the Muslims. It's every moment that we have. Every moment that we have that we're not engaged in a task that we have to do in this life, it ought to be time that we can connect with the Lord, even if it's just a few short words. The Bible says for us to pray without ceasing. What about serving? That's doing the work of God. That's a, that is a craving that you have that God puts in your heart when you're born again. Not only, listen, not only do I need to be studying the Word of God and praying to the Son of God, I need to be doing a work serving for the work of God. Amen? Jesus said it, as the Father sent me, so send I you. He came to, to do the Father's will and finish the Father's work. Amen? But what about fellowshipping? That's being with the people of God. The Bible says, and here's a, here it is, evidence right here, listen. And every one of us have excuses. Every one of us are busy. Amen? We're all busy. But I'm telling you, if you're too busy for Jesus and you're too busy for Jesus' people, then you got some problems. Every opportunity that you can get together with God's people, that ought to be something that you get great joy out of. Now, I know uh, some of God's people are unusual. Let's just be honest. Some of them are weird, okay? But that's okay. We come together as one. One faith, one family, one focus. And the Bible says we know that we've passed from death, that's spiritual death, unto eternal life because we love being around the brethren and the cistern. We love being around God's people. Amen? 1 John 2, 3 says, And hereby we know that we know Him. What is this? If we keep His commandments. So that speaks about the Word of God. And, and 1 John 3.14 says, And we know that we pass from death unto life, because again we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So as I said earlier, I was saved on a Sunday evening, while in that particular time in my life, although raised in church, I was not attending church regularly. And that night I came to church after a powerful moving of the Holy Spirit came upon my dead, empty condition and said, You need to get your tail to church. And I came that night, and I, I've told you the story before, my testimony. I didn't come down in the invitation. Brother Reed had left to go baptize. He baptized, and I went and ran up there and met him. And in that little bitty classroom up there, let me tell you, we got on our knees, and I asked for forgiveness of sins and salvation for my soul. And Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, quickened my dead spirit, and I've never been the same. And guess what? When I left that church that night, I couldn't wait to get back the next week. 
We had a college and career activity over at a house just right down the road here off of Beverly. And that I went and told everybody, guess what? I, I got saved. My family's been in this church since 1978. I've been here since I was a little 12-year-old boy. And I'll tell you what, I've been playing church. I knew the Bible. I graduated from a Christian school. I knew all those things. And I was lost and dead and on my way to hell. But that night, God saved me, quickened me by the power of His Holy Spirit. Amen. And I couldn't wait to get back to church. I wasn't in church at that time. It was a burden. I don't want to go to church. My dad would, Let's, you want to go to church, son? Cause I, and I was living at home. I was a grown man. And I was like, no, i got some things I need to do. Let's go to church. I don't know, maybe next week. Ed and Debbie Richter came by every week to visit me. We'd love for you to come be a part of our class. Come on. we got activities. We got, but, and, but here's the thing. The moment I was saved, what happened? I was changed, and my cravings changed. And I didn't want to come to church before, but then all of a sudden, I couldn't get enough of church. Amen? But then we talk about the conversation that comes with the new life. Luke chapter 7, verse 14, you know, I've turned there, I'll read it for you. And he came and touched the bear, and they that bear him stood still. This is a young man in the casket. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Oh, mama was happy that day. Notice carefully that he was raised from the dead. The first thing that he did when he got raised from the dead was he sat up and he spoke up, amen? And there are certain activities that were evidence that he was now alive. What were they? They were signs that he was alive. Two guys had walked down at a funeral to their friend in, in the casket and they want to pay their last respects. And one looked at the other and said, if that were you, what would you want your friends to say about you? And he thought for a minute, he, he said, what would I want my friends to say about me? Look, he's alive. <laughs> Amen? Look, he's moving. Listen, dead people don't move. In fact, dead people don't do anything. Why? They're dead. They're dead. But when there is a conversion, then there's a conversation. And you know what this word means right here? And I use this word in the alliteration of the message because conversation here is not just your talk, it's your walk. It's your entire daily life. That's what it is right there. It speaks of how you live your daily life. I'm not talking about Sunday. I'm not talking about when you're in youth group on Wednesday night. I'm talking about every day when it's just you and Jesus. Philippians 127 says, only let your conversation, that's your daily living, be as becometh the gospel of Christ, and that whether I come and see you or else be absent, that I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind doing what? Striving together for the faith of the gospel. Amen? So notice this. A new life in Christ results in what? A conversation. A daily living, listen, that is spiritually driven by what? God's word to do God's will. Amen? Are you with me still? On the day that I got saved, I not only wanted to go to church again as quickly as possible, I wanted to tell everybody about what God had done for me. That night, the next day, the next week, and folks, I'm going to tell you, ever since then, I want to get around to the opportunity to talk about Jesus. Oftentimes it comes from the fact that, you know what, I'm a pastor. And when they find that out, they're, you can see the shift sometimes, but it's an opportunity to share the gospel. It's an opportunity to talk about why I believe different things than the world believes. Why? I can't help it. I can't help it. It's like a burning fire in my soul. I cannot help it. I've been raised from the dead, and you know what? I want to speak about what God did in raising me from the dead. And if you've truly been made alive in Christ by the Lord Jesus, there's always going to be the evidence in your life in Christ Jesus. Amen? Listen, if we're singing and you just stand there with your arms folded, you're not interested, we're giving, and, and you're just sitting, you're going, I, I'm not singing the hymn in your mind, maybe I shall not be moved. If you're hearing the preaching and 
and you, you don't ever take time to get in the Bible and check out what I'm saying, amen? I don't care if it's digital or if it's the, the, the old black book. I, I, pages fall out of my book at the funeral the other day, my Bible. But that's my Bible. I want my Bible. Without my glasses, I can't even read it anymore. It's too small. But I want my Bible. It's got everything in all these years of ministry in there. Notice the last thing, and we'll be done this morning. The effect of the new life. Folks, I'm telling you, if your life has not changed, it's an, it, it, it could be an indication that you're spiritually dead still. Why? Because there's always evidence. But notice the effect. Let me just point out a couple of things here, and we'll be done. These that were raised from the dead, the, what, what was the first thing? There was praise brought to the Lord Jesus. And Luke 7, 16 and 17 says this, and there came a fear on all. Well, I would say so. People are being raised from the dead. So here, this fear was a reverential fear. And what happened? And they glorified God saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. Let me tell you, the miracle of raising someone from the dead resulted in the Lord Jesus Christ being glorified and praised and preached all around the area. Amen? So where's your Jerusalem? Where's your Judea? Where's your Samaria? Where's your uttermost parts of the earth? When, when you're saved, when a dead man's made to walk in spiritual new life, you can't help but, but, but share that. And when that's shared, it's then spread. I'm telling you, church, when I got saved, I got life. I got life. And it was a life that I committed that by the grace of God and for the glory of God, I'm going to live every moment of every day for Him. Amen? The old, old time songwriter nailed it when she said this. She said, all for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my beings, ransom powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. Let my hands perform His bidding. Let my feet run in His ways. Let my eyes see Jesus only and let my lips speak forth His praise. Since my eyes are fixed on Jesus, I've lost sight of all beside. So enchained my spirit's visions looking at the crucified. All for Jesus, all for Jesus looking at the crucified. All for Jesus, all for Jesus looking at the crucified. Oh, what wonder, how amazing, Jesus, glorious King of kings, deems to call me His beloved. Let me rest beneath His wings. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, resting now beneath His wings. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, resting now beneath His wings. Church, dead people made alive want to praise the one that raised them to life. Amen? That's it. Praise. And then notice the people that were brought. John eleven forty five 45, and, and many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things what Jesus did. And here's what, they, here's what happened. This was the result. And they believed on Him. See, when you get made alive and you show the evidence of that and you praise God for that, what happens? People are brought to God from that. Amen? The greatest spiritual billboards in the world are those that have been raised from death to life. Amen? Listen, there's a world out there. They're not going to read the Bible, but they read people that read the Bible. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. I'm closing. What's been removed from your life since you were saved? What's been removed from your life since you were saved? What's been done with your life since you've been saved? See, we, we can talk about the, the don'ts, but what about the do's? See, we're saved from something and saved to something. We're saved from sin, hallelujah, but we're saved for service. 
We're not saved to sit and soak and sour. We're saved to do what, church? Serve the Lord Jesus. I was at work yesterday when word of the assassination attempt on President Trump's life came, and I watched the video. And when I saw him go down, I, I got to be honest with you. In my flesh, I was furious. I was fighting mad, and I thought, you know what, this is it. They're going to lead us to a civil war. This country is divided. And we're going to, you know what, and there are people with means. And I don't want that. I want to see revival in America. I saw President Trump, and I watched him as he went down. But then when he got up, I guess in the, in the midst of everything, his shoes fell off. He probably had some slip ons or something. I don't know. The shoes, he goes, I got, give me my shoes. And they were ready on one, on you. We're going, we're going, we're going. And I remember how when President Reagan was shot and how they just threw, the, threw him in the car and he had taken a shot in the lungs right here. And then and President Trump goes, no, wait, wait. And with his head totally exposed above them because he's a tall man, he went like that. And he said, fight, fight. What was he saying? Wait, wait. I've got I've to I've give a message to the people. What was it? I'm alive. It's good. I'm okay. And my heart breaks for the poor gentleman that died and the other one that was wounded. And my fear this morning is the perpetrator is in hell burning. That fist in the air with that look of defiance was a sign to me, I'm alive and, 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 and people, I'm more alive perhaps than I've ever been. He was letting people know I'm more committed than ever. And I'm not here to glorify him. I don't, I don't agree with him on a lot of stuff. And, and I'm sure you might love him. You might not love him at all. We're commanded in the Bible not to hate anybody. And he's not perfect. And I guarantee you there's no other candidates lined up to be anything in this country that are perfect. And even the ones that profess Christians ought to quit professing that they are that because they're not living that. But you know what I realized in that moment when I saw that? God does not raise up nations. God raises up men. Men of strength and women too, by the way. Men of courage, men of faith, men, men who are fearless, men who will fight, men who are willing to stand alone if necessary. And men that are willing to sacrifice everything for what they believe to be right. Men are willing to give their all to protect their families and the families of others against the wiles of the evil one we know as the devil. And God raised up a man in that garden paradise, Adam. That was his finest creation. You remember what God said? It's good. And although sin had destroyed that creation, God through the Lord Jesus Christ had raised that creation back to life and restored that creation to do what? To serve him as a man among men. And that's what, church hear me, that's what you and I are to be, a man among men, a woman among women. To stand up and to stand out, to be different. The world is full of dead people. Spiritually speaking, and maybe someone here this morning. And I don't know about you, but I'm alive in Jesus Christ, amen. The Holy Spirit of God lives in me. And he lives in you that are saved. And I beg God before I walk out here, any moment, whether it be to preach Jack's, Brother Jack's funeral or to preach this message, God, I'm nothing. All I am is, is, a, is a, an old guy that's got a tired body, but I got a big mouth. 
Use it for your glory. And all glory goes to you. Amen? A godly man of faith and a, and, and a godly man for the faith. That's what we need to be. Are you a dead man walking this morning? Today's the day that you can be alive in Christ. I don't care what you did way back when. I don't care what church you're a part of. I don't care who's pastor of the church, who he was. I don't care what hand you shook or what cards you filled out or how many times you got dunked in some baptistry or shot in the face with a little bit of water or, 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 or a little cross on your head. I, when you're, I, I don't care. You're either a dead man walking or you're alive in Christ. And friend, if there's the root of salvation in your life, there will be the fruit of salvation. If you're alive in Christ, I'm going to tell you something here and it's a challenge. Prove it by the signs of Christ in your life. We stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our Father God in heaven, oh holy God, we come before you. And God, you know my heart. I don't stand up here as some self-righteous, super holy roller Joe that has it all figured out and I walk around singing hymns all day long. God, I'm just a man. And unfortunately, because of the flesh, a man that's prone to stray and wander if I'm not careful. But God, I'm a man that I know July 26, 1992, I was dead in trespasses and sins. And that night, through the miraculous work of your Holy Spirit. I, the presence was of God, you were so real, it was like the Lord Jesus sat down right beside me and put his arm around me and drew me to him. And he said, Rick, you want to be alive? You're dead. You want life? I freely offer it to you if you'll accept it. I won't force it on you, but I offer it to you if you'll accept it. And while, I, dear God, I didn't have the boldness to walk down out of embarrassment perhaps, I found my pastor. And on my knees in a little classroom upstairs at 3116 Borton Lane, Liberty Baptist Church, I begged for forgiveness of sins and begged for salvation for my soul. I'd done things before. God, I had made professions of faith. I'd been baptized before, but I was lost. It wasn't sincere. In those moments, I don't even know if I fully understood what, what I was doing or, or what I thought I was doing. But God, that night, July 26, 1992, after that Sunday night service, I sure did. And the results were instant. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, immediately it's proved out because old things pass away and all things become new. God, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for sanctification, Lord, that to your glory, I'm trying to be a little more like Jesus every day. I want the word of God to permeate my heart and to penetrate my heart so that that. And David said it, how, how shall a young man cleanse his ways? And he said, by taking heed to the word of God. And that's how our lives will become more like Christ every day, to be in the word and do it. Be obedient to it. And Jesus said it, if you love me, keep my word, keep my commandments. So God, maybe this morning somebody here, they need to be alive today. They came in a dead man or a dead girl. They can leave out alive. Lazarus, come forth. Son, sit up. Sweet maiden, get up and get some food. Rick Ross, get up.
stand up. You're saved now. It's time to go serve me. God, I don't know what your, the needs are this morning, but I pray in Jesus' name that you would have your will and your way. God, maybe there's somebody here that's ne- they, they know Jesus. They've given their life to Christ, but they've never been baptized. Lord, I want them to come this morning. I want them to take Brother Copeland by the hand or maybe even go to the back of the auditorium, take Brother Colin by the hand if they're a you. And if they've never been baptized, I want them to, to let them know, I've been saved. I know that to be true but I need to be baptized. That's a first step of obedience. I need to be baptized. They that gladly received the word were baptized. And Lord, maybe there's somebody that's looking for a church home. And, and Lord, we're probably not going to be on the top ten list of most popular churches because we preach truth. We preach it strong and, and sometimes we preach it long. But God, we, we do what we believe your will is and we don't care about the rest of it. We want to bring glory to you. And we want that to happen right now in this invitation time. So God, with heads bowed and eyes closed, have your will and your way in Jesus' name. So as the music begins to play this morning,